Hello, uh, those of you who have been following our um, Sunday meditation, Sunday devotions uh, for the last four weeks, know that we have been discussing the subject of faith, what faith is and what faith does. Uh, several weeks ago, we learned about how faith saves. It saves because through faith, we receive God's gift of forgiveness, won for us by Jesus on the cross. Um, two weeks ago, we learned about how faith is a powerful transformation that affects both our intellect, our will, and our emotions. And last week, we talked about the fact that faith is a living, growing thing. That means that our faith can grow stronger, that our faith should produce fruit, but also that our faith needs nutrition. It needs to be watered and fed through the Word of God. Today, we're going to look at the subject of what faith believes and how faith puts those beliefs into action. And, and this is a, a, a part of faith that is a lot more practical. If you will, what we're going to be talking about today is what are the rules of our Christian faith? Maybe you've noticed that a lot of Christians have differing opinions on what the rules are. Perhaps maybe on one occasion you may have had a glass of wine in your hand and somebody came up to you and said, I thought you were a Christian. Christians aren't supposed to drink anything, right? Or maybe you found yourself in the middle of a long argument about whether babies should be baptized. Faith is what we believe about Jesus but faith is also what we believe about everything else and why we believe it. And I think that that's an important subject for us to consider, especially in this time. Because lately, uh, there have been a number of people who have made statements, uh, basically speaking for all Christians, that are rather controversial. Maybe you've heard somebody say, Wearing a mask shows a lack of faith. Or maybe you've heard somebody say, Christians should ignore the warnings about social distancing and trust in God and fill their churches to the brim as they worship together. Hello, this is Pastor Jim Ponko with the Sunday Devotion for November 29th, 2020. How do we respond to those kinds of things? What, what do we think? Jesus gives us a very simple answer. He answers by saying, it is written. He answers that way because he knows and understands that Satan is always trying to redefine faith and that God's word is the only basis for true faith. Let me read for you just two verses from the, the story of how um, Satan tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. This is Matthew chapter 4, verses uh, 6 and 7. Satan says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. That is, throw yourself down off the tower on the temple. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been studying the uh, story of Jesus being tempted by Satan for many years. And I always find myself tempted to think that Satan's temptations were not really all that bad. Oh, I mean the one was bad, right? Where Satan says to Jesus that if he bows down and worships Satan, that Satan will give Jesus all of the kingdoms of the earth. That's bad. That's, that's worshiping a false god, right? But what about the other two? Where Satan says, take some stones and turn them into bread. Or Satan says, jump off the tower and, and, and let the angels save you. Well, what's so bad about those? I mean, from a human perspective, there's something to be said for those things. If you found yourself wondering that, then you've really come face to face with the devious way that Satan tempts people. You see, Satan can't force us to do anything. 
but he can propose a good idea for us to try, right? In Jesus' case, Satan quotes a portion of Psalm 91. Psalm 91 was a psalm that talked about the Messiah, the Savior who was to come. And in it, it included a promise from God that he would send his angels to protect the Messiah. And then Satan says to Jesus, well, why don't you see if that'll work? I mean, you're the Messiah, jump off the tower. See if God sends his angels to protect you. Humanly speaking, Satan's idea might have sounded like a good one. I mean, after all, Jesus was standing on the tower at the top of the temple. If he jumped down, there would be thousands of people who would see as the angels came and saved him before he hit the ground. And for a lot of those Jewish people, just that very act would be a sign. The sign that they were looking for to prove to them that, that Jesus was indeed the Messiah that they had awaited. And besides that, otherwise Jesus was going to have to spend years trying to teach people to understand who he really was and, and to put their trust in him as their Savior and Messiah. With just one magical display, maybe Jesus could change everything. And then there's Jesus himself. Remember, this, this temptation comes at the end of 40 days in the desert where Jesus had not eaten a thing. He was hungry. He was exhausted. He felt alone. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have the angels come and, and just carry him for a little while, right? And there is, after all, no better way to get people to listen to what you have to say than a sign of God from heaven. Besides, God had promised the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus, that he would do this sort of thing. But as tempting as Satan's idea was, it was a temptation to sin. Jesus points out that it would not have been an act of trust it would have been an effort to test God. If Jesus jumped, he would no longer be fully obedient to his Father's saving plan. He would no longer be able to fulfill God's law perfectly. He would no longer be able to give his life on the cross for the sins of the world, and we would all be lost in our sin. See, that's the thing about Satan. They may seem that way, but Satan's temptations are not innocent su suggestions. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy us in hell. And the thing is, too, Satan is really good at twisting God's word just enough so that he can lead people away from their Lord. And that's why Christians need to be discerning. They need to be able to listen to what's being told them, even when people are quoting the Bible, and recognize, recognize when what they're saying doesn't really follow all that God's Word says. Let me give you a couple of examples that are real common today. One of them is those, those evangelists that you sometimes see on television. Um, they're very popular. And one of the reasons that they're popular is because Many of them preach what's called a prosperity gospel. And what that means is that they say that if you ask God for some specific blessing, and if you ask with a strong enough faith, God will give you that blessing. Just ask for it. And then they imply that if God doesn't give you that blessing, it must mean that your faith is not strong enough. And then and then many Christians find themselves wondering, is their faith strong enough? Do they really have faith? Do they really have salvation? Do you see how Satan can lead people astray? And then there are another group of, 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 of preachers. I like to call them charismatic revivalists. They, they say, you've got to have a conversion experience, some powerful emotional experience that proves that you are a, a child of God. A believer, a real believer. And again, people can wonder, is my experience 
powerful enough? Am I really saved? When the real question is answered, simply, Jesus died for our sins. It's not based on some experience we have. It's not whether God gives us some blessing that we pray for. But here's the thing. There are plenty of other people who claim that they're sharing something that God says. How do we tell the difference between God's truth and Satan's distortion? Jesus gives a simple example in his conversation with Satan here. He says to Satan, after Satan quotes from Psalm 91, it is also written, and then he quotes from Moses. But the key thing there is that word also. You see, with that word, Jesus acknowledges that yes, Satan has properly quoted from the Psalms, but God also says more on the subject. Satan quoted the Psalms. Jesus quotes God speaking through Moses to the people of Israel as he gives them the commandments. God says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. What does that mean? To put God to the test means to demand miraculous proof of God's care. And testing God is wrong because it breaks the first commandment, because it's an attempt to tell God to do something rather than to trust that God will do what he promises. Take for example, if a Christian has diabetes and they've been treated for it for a long time with insulin, and then one day they decide they're going to stop taking their insulin and they're not going to take any other treatment and they say that I am going to trust God to heal me. What they're really doing is testing God. What they're doing is they're telling God that he has to take care of them miraculously. See, Satan wants us to test God. He wants us because it's a great way for him to deceive us. See, testing God looks like faith, but it appeals to our sinful nature. You see, our sinful nature has pride. It would love to be able to say, I have more faith than you do because I'm doing something that's so dangerous that you're afraid to do it, but I'm not afraid to do it. But our sinful nature is also selfish. It doesn't think anything of doing something that endangers other people by just saying, well, I have faith, so it's okay for me to do this. Allow me some specific examples. There have been churches that have announced that they won't recognize the government's authority to limit the size of public gatherings. They say, no, we're not going to listen to what the government says. We're going to trust God. But here's an interesting irony. Every one of those churches, before they were able to open their worship building, was given a limit to the number of worshipers by the fire marshal. Did they abide by that limit? Doesn't God call us to obey earthly leaders? And don't Christians have a part to play in reducing the spread of this virus? Or what about this one? I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Somebody says wearing a mask shows a lack of faith. Does it? What about God's warnings throughout the Bible that we should not harm our neighbor by our carelessness? Did you know that in the Old Testament, God had very specific rules for people who were suffering from the contagious disease of leprosy? They were required to socially distance from their community so that they would not spread the disease to other members of their community. You know, it's my recollection that when the government first started encouraging people to wear masks, 
It was not so that the masks would protect the wearer. It was so that the masks would protect others if the wearer had the virus and didn't realize it. Do you see? The real question is not whether I trust God, it's whether I love and care about other people enough to do something extra to protect them. Last week I, I reread a letter uh, that was written by Martin Luther uh, during the Black Plague. You've maybe heard of the Black Plague. It was a horrible, contagious, fatal disease. And at one time, the Black Plague came to Wittenberg, the little city where Martin Luther lived. Now, many of the people of the city who could fled the city um, to, to, to stay safe. Luther stayed. He stayed to minister to the people who couldn't leave. But as I was reading this letter that Luther wrote, two things stuck out to me. First of all, Luther refused to criticize those who had left the city. He was convinced that they weren't showing a lack of faith by seeking to protect themselves or to protect their families from, the, from this contagious disease. But then there was something else. Luther would do nothing to endanger the lives of others. He writes that if the doctors tell him that he could spread the disease by visiting certain people, he won't visit those people. You see, Luther wasn't just concerned about his own safety. He was concerned about the safety of others. And I think that that's a good illustration of what faith is. Faith learns from Scripture, but not just some of Scripture. It doesn't cherry-pick the parts of Scripture that make the person feel better about themselves. It learns from all of Scripture. And faith is concerned about the welfare of others. And faith will always, as Jesus says, go back to this statement. It is written. Well, let's pray. For all the people throughout the world to strengthen believers and to enlighten unbelievers, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For peace and justice among nations, for honest leaders and good neighbors, for the gift of love, for steadfast faith and patient endurance, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer pain or sorrow, for the lonely and depressed, for the poor and needy. For those who love us and those who hate us, we pray, Lord, have mercy. Be gracious to us, defend us by your power, and bring us to glory everlasting. To you, O Lord, we entrust ourselves. And Lord, you have taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and preserve us. Amen.